Hello guys, Winston here. You might have noticed that my upload schedule through the month of September was, well, basically non-existent. A job came up that upended my project plans and I'm finally in a position where I'm ready and able to share what that was. About a month and a half ago, I was approached by Light Metal Age, a publication dedicated to the aluminum industry about the possibility of manufacturing a run of custom aluminum drink coasters, a novelty market I sort of stumbled into with a previous project. The requirements for the coasters were laid out as follows, 3.5 inch square overall dimensions, rounded corners, beveled edges, clear anodized over a brushed aluminum finish, a permanently engraved graphic on the face with a noticeably tactile contrast, and a cork lining on the bottom. All doable, but the kicker was that they wanted 150 units and they needed them by mid-October. I did the math and it was right at the theoretical envelope of what I figured I could produce given the time constraints. So I gave it a bit of thought, got some preliminary quotes, and after a lot of encouragement from my maker friends, I committed to the project. The plan was as follows. Machine 3.5 inch square coaster blanks from 3 16 inch thick aluminum plate, complete with the recess pocket for cork to be added later, add a chamfer to the outside profile by hand, get the coasters anodized, have the coasters laser engraved, glue on laser cut cork squares, and deliver the coasters. It sounded good in theory, but like many plans, it fell apart upon first contact of end mill with aluminum. Let's start at the top. The first operation was supposed to be something I could handle without a problem. The Shape Oko 3 is without a doubt an aluminum capable platform. I've machined aluminum on it a few times before, and I know some people actually prefer machining it to wood. It was going to involve just two simple tool paths patterned out. Pocket the inside, contour cut the outside. Piece of cake, right? I purchased 12 by 12 inch sheets of stock to start with. I could get 9 coasters out of each sheet, and McMaster has a warehouse 40 minutes from my house so I could get aluminum on super short notice. This was important because I had very little margin for error in my projected schedule. Once I got home, I dropped a plate onto my machine and held it down with a combination of clamps and double-sided tape. I loaded up a quarter inch zirconium nitride coated end mill, generated some experimental tool pads, and said a quick prayer to the machining gods. But what I should have done instead was check my collet tightness. I'm used to cutting wood where you can sufficiently clamp down on your end mill just by using the spindle lock and a single wrench. But end mill torques when you're cutting aluminum are way higher and I destroyed my first test piece. Fortunately, I didn't destroy my end mill. The first few coasters were touch and go as I fine tuned my feeds and speeds. I wanted to run at a more aggressive pace to save time, but I was forced to scale back due to some unwanted vibrations during cutting. I backed down from a feed rate of 30 inches per minute to 25 inches per minute and decreased the optimal load parameter in my adaptive clearing toolpath to about 0.1 inches. Then I proceeded to test the second operation, the cutout of the coaster blank. Contour cutting in metals is probably the single most stressful thing you can do on a Shape Oko. Without the benefit of a steady stream of cutting fluid, tool engagement on both sides of the machine slot causes a substantial amount of friction. This manifests itself as heat, which is generally terrible for cutter life. This is the crux of machining aluminum with hobby grade machines. They might be powerful enough to cut metal, but thermal considerations and limited rigidity restrict what you can do. In the triangle of engineering trade-offs between good, cheap, and fast, the latter leg is what you're going to be missing out here. Despite destroying the coating on my cutter, I tried pressing on until I received the final nail in the coffin for machining the coaster blanks on my Shape Oko. I noticed that the depth of my cuts were getting really inconsistent, and when I took a closer look at my workpiece, I got a rude surprise. The inherent bow in my aluminum plate was causing the middle of my stock to rise up 15 to 20 thousandths of an inch. And it wasn't an isolated incident, a lot of my stock was this bad, and it was beyond the capabilities of my double-sided tape to flatten it out. Thin sheet stock can be quite vulnerable to warping during its production process. Internal strain in your stock can even cause deformations to increase as material is removed, much like in wood. Products like Mike 6 cast aluminum plates are specifically engineered to counter these effects, but even if I'd thought about it beforehand, using precision cast plates would have raised my unit prices by no small margin. Plus, the material I had on hand was perfectly fine for making coasters. A 3.5 inch square tile of aluminum isn't going to manifest enough warpage from corner to corner to affect its function. But the tool I had at my disposal just wasn't the right one. As much as I wanted to keep production in-house to the greatest extent possible, I had to accept the fact that it just wasn't practical. So the following business day, I put out my feelers for a water jet cutting service. Within six hours, I'd found a company and delivered the remainder of my stock material to them. The company I used was Tables and Stone Water Jet Cutting. They do custom countertops and tile work, but they also take on outside jobs like mine. And although there were complications with the process that I'll get into later, I do want to take a moment to express my appreciation to the owner, Ralph Scarola, for taking on this project in such a timely manner. Within a week, I had a box of aluminum tiles back from him, ready for secondary machining. 
Before I could machine these blanks though, I had to grind off the little spur of extra material left by the lead-in lead-out of the water jet toolpath. And because this meant I'd have a polished edge on one side, it meant I needed a polished edge on all the other faces too, so I started knocking out some of those at the same time. To cut my recess pockets efficiently, I devised an MDF fixturing plate that would hold multiple coasters at a regular 4-inch interval. I actually made two, one for the Shape Oko 3 and one for its XL brother. Using hard stops on two sides, I figured this would let me repeatedly position the coaster blanks. Unfortunately, there were some difficulties with this plan. First off, flipping the fixturing plate over was bad enough for 9 coasters, let alone 21. They kept falling out and I had to realign them. Realigning the blanks with the fixture was tedious at best. An improvement to this method was to use a secondary jig that was permanently affixed to my table. This way, I could drop in my blanks and secure the top plate with just a few bolts. The bottom plate would counteract the majority of the lateral forces generated during cutting, so the top plate just needed to keep my coasters from flying out. Occasionally during cutting though, I would discover a tile that wasn't pocketed dead center causing one or two of its walls to be slightly thinner than expected. At first, I thought I might be skipping steps on my CNC, but the problem kept showing up sporadically despite rehoming my machine between runs, and it wasn't like the last coaster was always the worst, sometimes the fourth one was worse than the fifth one. And then when I was loading up a new batch of coasters, it struck me. There shouldn't be this much play in my fixed string jig. I cut these pockets to be almost a snug fit, just a couple thou over nominal. I sampled a larger number of my blanks and found that some of them were off by 10 or even 20 thousandths of an inch. It's highly unlikely that the water jet that cut these was improperly calibrated, what's more likely is that my sheets of stock shifted during cutting. My aluminum plates didn't have a lot of mass or surface area, so little disturbances from the startup of the water jet could have nudged my plates. Honestly, if I hadn't already purchased square foot plates, I would have preferred to send 2x4 foot sheets of aluminum or larger for water jet cutting. It would have been more efficient and resulted in less waste, but the stability advantage of a larger plate never crossed my mind until it was too late. The only thing I could do to mitigate this issue was to remove as little material as possible from the blanks until after machining. By sanding the edges flat, I was removing a couple thousands of material and worsening the fitment problem. What I ended up doing was using part of my fixturing plate as a go-no-go -no -go check. I'd sand off just enough of the entry point spur and sometimes an adjacent side for the blank to seat firmly in the fixture. That's as far as I would go with sanding until after machining. With this change to my workflow, my resulting cuts were noticeably more consistent and, with the correct feeds and speeds, I was running multiple production lines of coasters. You'll notice that I wasn't running a ton of coasters at a time on my XL or Nomad. These machines aren't acoustically enclosed, so I ran them for shorter periods of time when my roommates and neighbors were absent. Every minute mattered, and getting ahead by even just a couple coasters a day helped. Following machining, I would sand each coaster's edges on an inverted belt sander. Because of the variations in coaster dimensions, it was impossible to finish them on the CNC. Then, to get that brushed aluminum finish, I set a couple coasters at a time in part of my fixed ring jig and ran the belt sander over them. You don't need to get these perfect, just sand it enough so that all the texture runs parallel. The deeper streaks of oxidation will be stripped in the pre-wash before anodizing. The last step I did was to break all the edges on the belt sander. It wasn't possible to chamfer these on the CNC because of the subtle differences in overall dimensions. Working by hand, you have to learn a particular rhythm in order to make the chamfered edges consistent. This is something that someone like Duresta would make look effortless, but it took me a while to really dial in how much pressure to apply, how quickly to rotate the coasters, and how long to sand each side. Then, once these were done, I rushed them off to anodizing. The turnaround for this was 8 days, and I was a little stressed about it because it was longer than I'd hoped. The SpaceX coasters I made were done within two days, but a batch this large can't really be fit in between other jobs so I was at the mercy of the shop's schedule. Once I got these coasters back from anodizing, I immediately sent them off to get laser engraved. While the coasters were out of my house again, I had to pivot to cutting out the cork pads. These were going to be super simple laser cut squares. I would mark my name on the backs with a branding iron afterwards since rastering with a laser is a lot slower than vector cutting. This wasn't my laser so I wanted to minimize the disruption to my friend's schedule. To make material loading as efficient as possible, I concocted a simple little tray that was sized to just under the cutting area of the laser. I would be able to lay cork down on it and then use magnets to hold it flat. This made material loading super easy and quick. Cork cutting went off without a hitch. When I got home, I set up my branding iron and marked the backs of each cork piece. As with the previous tasks on the belt sander, it takes a small amount of time to dial in your hand-eye coordination to repeat each action quickly and effortlessly. When my coasters had finished being laser engraved, I was at T-6 days to a hard delivery deadline. I glued on the cork pads, going through a full tube's worth of E6000. This stuff isn't the healthiest to inhale, so I was doing this in my garage with the door fully open and a box fan running. I got this done in less than two hours. 
I gave the coasters 36 hours to set in the workshop before shipping them out where they'd have another 3-4 to four days to cure. And then finally, I could relax. This project genuinely gave me nightmares. Between the wrench thrown into my machining plans and trying to coordinate the efforts of multiple shops, I always had a nervous eye on the calendar. But I also learned a ton about planning and scheduling my own projects, gained some experience wrangling vendors in other shops, and added a couple more options to my list of possible fabrication and finishing processes for future projects. If I could do it all again, there are a couple key things I would have done differently. First off, I would have opted for a rougher cut for my coaster blanks from the water jet. With the water jet, you pay for time and abrasive. Smoother cuts take longer, and since I was polishing up the edges anyway, I could have requested faster cuts with no regard to surface finish. Secondly, I would have had the coasters cut oversized by about 10 thousandths of an inch and invested in a vacuum work holding setup. This would let me hold the coaster blanks in such a way that I could profile them to exact overall dimensions and leave a smooth finish without having to hand polish the sides. That would in turn make pocketing and beveling the blanks much easier. Lastly, I would have gotten firm lead time estimates from all of the vendors, like for anodizing, so I could budget my schedule margin better. But these are all natural growing pains for a small shop like mine. The most important part is that I produce a completed product and shipped on time. And that is a wrap for this project. I want to thank you all very much for watching and for bearing with my absence through September. I'll try really hard to get back to my regular upload schedule and return with another CNC related project video in a week or two. Or three, but hopefully two. This is something that someone like Duresta would make look effortless, but it took me a while. Oh, damn it.